Well, welcome everyone. Um, welcome to what is, I think, the final the final lecture uh, for the CSRS's summer public lecture series, and thus my final public lecture is as acting director um, of the CSRS. Uh, my name is Kathy Chan. For those of you I don't know, and I've been the acting director um, for the 2022-23 academic year. Um, I'd like to open this final lecture by acknowledging my microphone here. Sorry about that. By uh, respecting the Lekwungen peoples on whose traditional territory the University of Victoria sits, and the Songhees, Esquimalt, and Wasanich peoples uh, who have continuing historical relationships with this land. Um, just before we get started, um, I also wanted to remind people, because I just reminded myself, to turn off your ringers on your on your cell phone if you if you have one. Um, and with that, I'm very pleased to introduce our lecturer today, uh, Dr. Brian Fraze. Fraze. Yeah. Fraze. Uh, Dr. Fraze is a professor of history at the Canadian Mennonite University in Winnipeg with particular research interests in evangelical religion and conservative politics on the Canadian prairies. This is Brian's second or third? This is my third teacher. Third stint as a visiting research fellow at the CSRS. And we really enjoyed his participation in our community this spring. Um, so welcome, Brian. We look forward to hearing your thoughts on prairie politics and the Bible. Thank you. Uh... Kathy, thanks everyone for, for coming. And before I begin, I also want to thank uh, formerly CSRS for accepting me uh, back. I think it's just to get the damage deposit back from previous years. So that's, that's what that is. But thank you for the opportunity to share some of my work here with you in a, in a more formal uh, context. And uh, I also would like to acknowledge the support of SHRC and my home institution, CMU, for research grants that continue to support the project. The Branding Irons of Antichrist, Prairie Politics and the Bible. Earlier in the 21st century, there was a demonstration by Alberta farmers and ranchers over labeling requirements in the wake of the mad cow disease crisis. And while none of this is surprising, or unexpected, one reporter noted what he thought was something rather peculiar. It was the circulation at one of these uh, demonstrations of a 1931 short nine-page play co-written by radio preachers William Aberhart and Ernest Manning. The play was called, you can probably guess, The Branding Irons of Antichrist. And it is about life immediately after the rapture, where in a certain form of Christian eschatology, the true believers in Christ are removed from the earth in preparation for Christ's second uh, coming. Immediately after the rapture, three adult children of a mother uh, are wondering what happened. Where did everybody go? Where's, where's mom? We have Mary, the daughter, who was religious and sincere, a church member, but unregenerate. The two sons, John and Howard, were worldly and indifferent. But there they were, feeling uneasy, crying a little, as they attempted to understand what had happened. Mary and her close friend Charles soon convert together and become born-again Christians, while her brothers enter into the militarized service of Antichrist. It is clear that Antichrist will soon have power over the world as governments cower before him. His first action is to eradicate religion and to help humanity with their uh, natural inclination to worship. Antichrist made an capital I image of himself uh, as the new object of devotion and refusal to bow down uh, was death, resulted in death. So as he controls as well, all trade and commerce, all people will be branded with his mark on their skin like cattle. And without the branding, one cannot buy or sell anything. Mary and Charles are executed. You're probably wondering how it ends. So here it is. Uh, Mary and Charles, they don't make it. They're, they're executed um, by one of her brothers, uh, actually. Uh, very moving. 
Uh, the play ends, though, with a voice, disembodied voice from behind a curtain, stating the moral lesson in case you missed it, that unless one be born again, that person will be left behind and face the branding irons of Antichrist. Where does this come from? And how did it have political and economic resonance 76 years later? Well, let's find out. <clears throat> In the decades prior to the Great Depression, exasper exacerbation, uh, tension with a distant federal government and Eastern Canadian industrialists and grain buyers protected by big finance led to farmer discontent and voluntary pools formed to help with securing better prices for their harvests and leverage purchasing power. This loose alignment of locals led in part to the 1909 creation of the United Farmers of Alberta, the UFA. In 1916, Henry Wise Wood became its president until 1931. In 1921, they changed from a purely economic entity into a political party, defeated the liberals who had controlled Alberta politics since provincehood in 1905. Wood was from Missouri, of disciples of Christ's background, he studied at the Christian University there. His religious background was that of a, a Christian restoration movement that dates back to the Second Great Awakening of the early 19th century that sought the unification of denominations to restore the church to its New Testament unity and roots. His theology was that of the social gospel. It emphasized the social character of Christianity held to post-millennial uh, a post-millennial eschatological vision, i.e. there will be a millennium of peace and perfection on earth after which Jesus will return, uh, as opposed to the Antichrist play, which would be called a pre-millennial um, eschatological vision, where the Christians are removed, uh, the tribulation, Christ will return, and then the millennium. And from that uh, vision of his post-millennial vision, uh, Wood believed in the establishment of the kingdom of God on earth in a social model guided by the ethical and economic teachings of Jesus Christ. But Wood was also from the American Midwest and strongly influenced by progressive evangelical Christianity on the frontier there and its emphasis on individual conversion, cooperation, and voluntary association. And these threads wind around each other in his thought, both religious and political. So, the more common variant of, of social gospel from Walter Rauschenbusch, most famously, that shaped many upcoming clergy, uh, Wood rejected that in part. Wood found that the more academic, intellectual, and elite version favored an imposition on the people by government over economic practices. Rather, his vision was that of a prophetic society maintained through the voluntary association found in pools, which he was a strong supporter of. Exemplified to his mind, the New Testament ideal of cooperation. He read the book of Revelation, the final book of the Bible, as a struggle between social laws culminating in the creation of the New Jerusalem built upon the teachings of Jesus, exemplified by the Sermon of the, on the Mount. Moreover, this would happen on earth not quickly, but through an evolutionary process that they can enact. Wood's presidency ended in 1931. He was followed by Robert Gardner, who took the UFA um, significantly leftward, eventually leading to the renunciation of fiscal conservatism. And then three things happened to result in their um, uh, electoral loss in 1935. One, the Depression. It was hard for any incumbent to withstand that thing. So that's probably only need one reason, maybe. But two, in 1932, the UFW joined another association of farmers, labor groups, communists, academics, ministers, socialists, to form the Cooperative Commonwealth uh, Federation, CCF, which formally organized in Regina the next summer. And this generated some mistrust amongst members as to what was happening to their party which made at the time here in depression era, we're early thirties, 
uh, the new social credit party and its familiar radio preacher and outsized personality, William Aberhart, attractive. And third, Premier John Brownlee was caught in a sex scandal with a clerk in the Attorney General's office. So there you have it, 1935, it's busy. Aberhart is from Huron County, Ontario, and in 1910 moved to Calgary as a principal and math teacher. While he grew up as a young man in Southern Ontario in a nominally Presbyterian home, he found himself drawn to itinerant revival preachers and the teachings of dispensationalist C.I. Schofield, dispensationalism being a method of biblical hermeneutic that divides the scripture into portions that relate to different dispensations of time based upon covenants. Uh, it's a long, we could do the whole semester just on that, but that, that's good enough, I think, for, for now. Uh, but it has a strong eschatological component as people reading it this way, look, future, when's Jesus coming back? And what are the signs of the age currently? C.I. Schofield famously uh, produced the Schofield Reference Bible, where using the King James Version added textual uh, footnotes and paratextual apparatus to key the, the, the Bible verses to this particular scheme. And fun fact, I believe it is still Oxford University Press's uh, bestseller all time. So, yeah, exciting. Yeah, I always trip myself up when I get to that. Uh, we'll let that sink in. So impressed was he with C.I. Schofield, he took one of his correspondence courses and in 1905 himself became a lay preacher. In Calgary, by 1918, he began a, a Bible conference, the Calgary Prophetic Bible Conference, which would gather people for intensive Bible study and to contemplate the return of Jesus. His lectures there became very popular, and in 1925, he began broadcasting them on radio. At its peak, his radio audience numbered up to 350,000 listeners who took in his mostly literal reading of the Bible reflections on Jesus's return, and eventually, in the early 1930s, his social credit theory that was brought into the mix. At the same time, he constructed the Calgary Prophetic Bible Institute, his Bible school, in 1927. Meanwhile, if this was a graphic novel, right? Meanwhile, significantly, just a few years earlier in Three Hills, Alberta, just between, between um, uh, Calgary and Edmonton, closer to Calgary, but off the main, the main highway, the Prairie Bible Institute opened under L.E. Maxwell. He came from Kansas in 1922 to teach the Bible and grew to be a very influential evangelical leader in, in Alberta. His Bible Institute, as you can see in the, the up there, top corner, and that's his famous, most famous book, The Born Crucified Text. Uh, became one of the largest, became the largest school of its time in the 1940s uh, in the world. Specialized in missionary training, they sent missionaries around the world. And in fact, this is your fun fact of the, of the more afternoon, a McLean's Magazine article on the school in the early 1950s made the point that there were places in Africa where people who had never heard of Toronto were well aware of Three Hills. But Maxwell, for the point of my story here today, existed as a foil to Eberhardt, and at times he and others at PBI were strong critics of Eberhardt's political career, social credit, and theology. Eberhardt always gave as good as he got, and with PBI having its own radio program and periodical, the two fought quite publicly with each other in harsh rhetoric, accusations, mutual accusations of heresy, and promiscuous use of hellfire imagery. As <clears throat> the uh, conference grew, the Prophetic Voice magazine, Eberhardt launched in October of 1924, uh, because he said, people today want to know what God has to say about the future. So he produced Prophetic Voice, a monthly periodical 
that had sermons and news from around the world and the such. He also, it also states in their mission statement, quote, we are fundamentalists in the actual sense of the word, not the popular sense. We are not funny mentalists, but Pauline heretics. Using Acts 24, 14, uh, the, uh, the apostle Paul is accused of being in a cult and dismisses that. And so they base it on this. He heavily criticized modernist biblical interpretations of scripture in particular, and his revulsion at all things modernistic was strong. He recounted, I met one of those modernists a few years ago, and he was a bird, a real fowl of the air in the scriptural sense, a religious Bolshevist. And as the conversation progressed, Eberhardt recalled that a dark scowl crept over his face as he spoke against reading the Bible literally. The nerve center of Eberhardt's religious operation was the school, Calgary Prophetic Bible Institute. And there's two pictures there. The doctrinal statement of the school did not just summarize their beliefs, but positioned themselves in the cultural battles of the day. The divine verbal inspiration of scripture and its infallibility led the dozen statements. That included such uh, elements as uh, the creation of humanity by the direct act of God and not an evolutionary process, and the final, excuse me, resurrection at the conclusion of the coming millennium. While their primary purpose was to hold services uh, and teach for the winning of souls for Christ, it was also to, quote, use every legitimate Christian means of combating and resisting modernism, higher criticism, skepticism, and sectarianism in all its forms, and then ultimately blunt the influence of modernists, evolutionists, and all skeptics. The first lesson in his Bible course, which was a heavily Schofield-influenced set of lessons that shaped the entire curriculum, was called dispensational truth. That is, without a knowledge of this system, the Bible remains a closed book. And after working through several reading strategies of the Bible that he dismissed as inadequate or outright heretical, and he included in these um, people who used the Bible as a charm to keep away spirits or disease, skeptics, Christian science, Mormonism, the pick and choose method of Bible reading, Seventh-day Adventism, and religious vegetarianism. And once that was all uh, taken care of, we unpack dispensationalism and read about what I tried to explain briefly, the right dividing of the Bible according to its time periods. Then the stock market collapsed, wheat prices fell to historic lows, the rain stopped, and the money dried up. The prairies arguably experienced the 1930s with more difficulty and suffering than other regions of Canada on account of the accompanying drought. Eberhardt still is a math teacher and principal. And in July of 1932, some of these pictures, uh, I forget which ones now, are, are from Alberta. So like, there's one of these red deer, uh, so forth. I tried to keep all the South Dakota pictures out because that's just false advertising, but a lot of dust. In July of 1932, Eberhardt arrived in Edmonton, as he did every July to mark exams. And at these annual grading sessions, he regularly met with a chemistry teacher, uh, Charles Scarborough, who was an avid reader of Major C.H. Douglas's social credit theory. And while they grade exams together, Scarborough would extol the virtues of social credit, hoping to attract Eberhardt to it, which he always resisted. But 1932 was different. That July, Eberhardt arrived in an unusually sullen mood. The economic depression and drought was seriously grinding on the Albertan economy, and he watched helplessly as the graduates of his school could not find work, and one of his students had even committed suicide that spring. Eberhardt, too, like many others, saw his income slashed as the Canadian jobless rate hit 20%, and Albertan incomes declined overall by 62% from 28 to 32, uh, second only to Saskatchewan. Even military enlistment excuse me, was a, a affected as Albertan young men were apparently rejected at an exaggerated rate on account of rickets caused by malnourishment. 
So there at St. Stephen's College, St. Stephen's College at the University of Alberta, Eberhardt converted to social credit and he received what he wanted, a simple formula for all economic problems that he could easily understand and explain. And a month after this conversion, Eberhardt began the work of establishing a social credit presence in Calgary and laid the foundation for a new political movement. Next door, as mentioned earlier, 1932, uh, we have a meeting, well, not quite next door yet, uh, in Calgary that forms uh, the CCF, which would include uh, and absorb the, the UFA. A year later, in July of 1933, they had their founding meeting uh, and formally uh, organized in Regina, adopted the Regina Manifesto, which famously declared their intention to not rest until capitalism was eradicated. Everyone knew that summer that there was another massive crop failure looming, that wheat prices remained historically low, and that radical measures were needed. It was an eclectic group of people, as I mentioned, farmers, labor leaders, outright communists, university profs, uh, um, ministers of the gospel, social gospel, and so forth. The social gospelers believed that Christianity was a social religion and that the economics is taught and exemplified, and there's echoes of wood here, uh, especially the Sermon on the Mount and the New Jerusalem of Revelation were guides to the contemporary ordering of society and proper human relations. These were not dispensations of the future or ideals to be realized in heaven. They were for our lives here on earth now. It was a practical eschatology that saw in the New Jerusalem of Revelation a guide grounded in a Christianity that leaned on social analysis and politics as they sought to realize the kingdom of God on earth. And the forerunner of the current NDP was, was formed. Now, on the picture of the, the rising sun, that was just a, it's a classic CCF promotional image, the, the family walking through a new era, the dawning of a new era, the rising sun of the CCF with prosperity, justice, uh, half words, freedom and security. Uh, I think there's full words on the actual document. I just don't have it here. Uh, and there's, there's a, perhaps an apocalyptic or a millennial tinge to this, or it could be seen that way. Uh, not entirely uh, far removed from uh, railway advertisements uh, for the West at this time as well. There was the famous CPR ad of the Angel of the West as she floated above uh, the prairies with her arms uh, outstretched, uh, beckoning people to come settle and farm. So here, the dawning of a new age, let's walk to these wonderful things to the sun of the CCF. And just for a little bit of amusement on the, the right, social credit, uh, was feared uh, in Saskatchewan by, by its leaders, from the, the, the Woodsworths to the uh, Tommy Douglases up through to the John Diefenbakers of the Conservative. Uh, they could unify on one element, and that was keep Eberhardt's theory out of here. Saw it as, as nonsense and unhelpful. And here, uh, you know, stay in your own backyard, and you'll see that the plague of locusts coming from Alberta uh, is, in fact, uh, a multitude of Eberhardt's. So at this founding was J.S. Woodsworth, former Methodist minister from Winnipeg, uh, who had actually been arrested in 1919 during the general strike there for quoting Isaiah 10, 1 to 2, which was a series of woes against oppressive authority. Although the CCF formed in 1933, its largest success came from Tommy Douglas, a former Baptist minister and social gospeler, Tommy Douglas uh, then formed uh, North America's first socialist government. And I put this up here because I thought, you know, if I'm going to talk about the Bible as much as I am, uh, I should have a picture of one. Like, what, is, what does it look like? Well, there, there's Tommy Douglas's Bible. Could not find one of Eberhard or Manning, interestingly enough. Uh, so you can go to the Canadian Museum of History. Uh, apparently, it's the only one he, he ever owned uh, in his adult life. And there it is open with some notes. So just something interesting to, to look at. Social credit promised prosperity and ease in the near future if it were followed. It was a technocratic philosophy premised upon two pillars, that technology will rescue humanity from toil and drudgery, and experts will solve society's problems in a technocratic bureaucracy. Pr 
prosperity would be perpetual as wages and prices continuously and expertly manipulated uh, to provide the greatest good for the most. This form of society, Eberhardt also considered to be the bedrock of democracy. In fact, it is the basis of democracy must be social credit. Eberhardt proposed that without interfering with the structures of private enterprise, ownership and responsibility, adjustments can be made to a monetary, pol to monetary policy that would necessitate the distribution of a society's cultural heritage or social credit to ensure a baseline of purchasing power. Nothing I say now is probably going to make any sense, and that, that's okay. I'm still getting my head around some of this too. The cultural heritage is the value of the society and its resources that due to rapacious bankers and a corrupt financial sector based in Eastern Canada, Albertans were missing out on their share of abundance. And the effective rallying cry for this was poverty against plenty. He used what he called the A plus B theorem to explain it. A is the cost paid to individuals, wages, for instance. B is the cost paid to organizations, fees, service charges, raw materials. So the cost of my little cup here uh, is going to be A plus B, the cost paid for the workers and the cost paid for the materials that, that, that made it. Thus, individuals will never reach their purchasing potential for cost will always be greater than A. The solution then is to find a way for individuals to have purchasing power higher than A plus B. And the solution he came upon was $25 dividend a month for every bona fide Albertan uh, citizen, adult citizen, that would come from, be backed by the social credit or the cultural heritage of the province, ensuring perpetual prosperity as it could be raised as prices went up. And it could also be manipulated so that if you're not actively looking for work, we can reduce your dividend. The program had everything for Eberhardt. It was moral in creating a just society. It weakened the Eastern financial grip on Alberta. It shared the inherent wealth uh, of the provinces with its citizens, and it was easily expressed in Christian terms. In fact, their, their meetings were often took, on, often took on the trappings of evangelical revival meetings. Opening up their uh, meetings with the hymn, Our God and Ages Past, they had singing, speakers, much enthusiasm, and many uh, and often holding Sunday picnics. These were supplemented with a growing network of social credit study groups, 1400 at its peak. People would gather and read social credit uh, literature and then discuss the material. Eberhardt did make, he, he wins a landslide victory in, in 1935, uh, not unexpected either. Uh, he himself actually didn't run. Uh, the party won, uh, and then he was brought in to be to be premier. Significantly, um, where am I? Uh, he made some attempts in his first couple of years to enact parts of his platform. So he wanted to, he took on the banks, attempted to to take control of monetary policy in the province, and he wanted to introduce a censorship law over the media and how it covered the social credit government everything uh, along these lines that he attempted was struck down by Ottawa, either the parliament uh, through disallowing the legislation or the Supreme Court. And the defeats did nothing to harm him, uh, it simply played into the messages that now we're losing to the big courts as well. Significantly, as early social credit held anti-large scale economic views, a central feature of dispensationalism it's also a belief that big finance, big banks, and centralized state power are the bedrock of a satanic system. That Eberhardt sought redemption for Alberta through an economic system that guaranteed ostensibly social justice and prosperity without recourse to the big corrupt banks and financiers melded seamlessly with his theology. Though his style was often described as dictatorial, and true, the power of the provincial government would be extended dramatically if he enacted all of this throughout the economy. He asserted continuously that this was the way out to create a base of egalitarianism predicated upon the individual living in free association with others. For him, even Easter was social credit. His Easter message, he expounded on the resurrection of Jesus saying, 
I think the movement which we represent is in perfect accord with the spirit of Easter. Easter is hope, deliverance, salvation. God can and will work a miracle to bring his people to a place of joy and prosperity. And is that not a message for all believers in social credit? This is a dispensational chart. As preacher, and this is his dispensational chart. As preacher and teacher, Eberhardt understood the Bible to be a collection of a variety of literary genres. But despite his acceptance of, variety, uh, of literary variety in the Bible, it was all governed by the dispensational scheme. Uh, what, are you familiar? Is this new to people? Yeah, maybe I should just stop here because this will take the, the next 15 minutes. Uh, this is the sketch of all of human history, right, right here. The top, the top third uh, is called the, the heavenlies. The stuff happening in heaven is taking place there. The bottom third is Sheol, the underground, the place of the dead. You'll see there's an Old Testament cemetery and then a, a tribulation cemetery. This is also the place where, where people have, have died. And then in the, the, the middle is us right now, in this room even, uh, human history on, on the ground. We live in number four right now called church or the dispensation of grace. And that will end when it does. Uh, uh, we will have the time of the Gentiles, which is tribulation of seven years of tremendous suffering. Uh, and then the millennial uh, kingdom for a thousand years you'll see at the far end, I should have got a pointer for this. Uh, and if you look on the, uh, on the left, you'll see uh, sun, right? Uh, right, go down a little bit, uh, eternal father, and you'll see a serpent in a tree. That's the story of the serpent in the garden of Eden. And you can trace where Satan is throughout history by the dark line that weaves around and it ends up in the lake of fire here at the end. Spoiler alert. Different sections of the Bible correspond to different parts of this. So you have uh, innocence, that's the prelapsarian condition of Adam and Eve in the garden. Uh, then there's the fall and then conscience, human government, promise, law, the Mosaic law. Uh, the devil seems to come down and cause some mess for the Israelites at this point, and then goes back up into the sky. Uh, then, of course, Christ, the cross. Uh, there is, at the end of the church age, the rapture. We, the, the saints go up, uh, and then the tribulation, the book of the seven seals, or the torments of earthquakes, locusts, plague, water turning to blood. All those images uh, come, come from there, uh, ending with the return of Jesus, peaceful millennium, uh, and uh, judgment, and then eternity. That's that's the rough sketch of, of of the curriculum. So this is this is the bedrock. This is this is your premier. This is this is how he understands history. Now he was accused by many people for not taking the depression uh, seriously enough as a theological matter. So some of his own uh, radio listeners thought you should be denounce, be denouncing this. Uh, as a, a judgment from God upon our society, whereas in his reading of it, uh, this was just an outbreak of satanic activity um, that, that fits in with the general narrative, church of uh, in the period of grace, but it will pass. So he gets into some, con uh, some um, controversies and, and debates uh, there with his own, with his own followers. Uh, some scholars, David Elliott comes to mind quickly, have, tried, have, have argued, Ted Regeer, I think, has made the point, too, that there seems to be a contradiction uh, because this scheme is also predicated upon everything always getting worse. Um, so how can you be a premier trying to make things better if your theological scheme makes things worse? Well, the answer for that is this idea of the millennium. Until there is a rapture, it could be anywhere from, what, seven to a thousand years in the future. So we've got to take care of things uh, now. So he did not see it as a contradiction uh, in, in the slightest. <clears throat> now related, so this is his reading the Bible, and the, the curriculum follows all these points all the way through, and it, it's fascinating uh, to read. But 
you're probably wondering, what about life before the Bible? Well, first of all, you get a social credit landslide. Oops, I'm, oh, I see it's upside down. Yeah, so everything's going back. We're getting closer to creations. They go, where my clothes go, right? Um, uh, you have this, the chart of the heavens. Before there was a Bible, the message was in the stars. And another important significant point of his, of his Bible teaching was, in fact, the use of stars, constellations, and the zodiac. Um, <clears throat> in, in one example, he discusses the constellation, the serpent holder, as related to Revelation uh, 2012, as standing before the time of judgment, uh, as the book of the Lamb is opened up and all the names are read, uh, written in small characters next to it. He presents this constellation Scorpio through the lens of Genesis 3.15, where Scorpio is tied to the cross. He's wounded. But then, quote, the scorpion struck the woman's seed, and he died, that is Christ, but was raised from the dead to destroy the works of the devil. You can read the entire Bible through the constellations, the stars, and the zodiac, according to, to Eberhardt. Um, the role of the zodiac and star mapping uh, was very important uh, to his uh, dispensationalism. When discussing the doctrine of God, for instance, he has an entire section called the signs of the zodiac, Reached a vision of it contains three constellations. Going back to the story of creation in Genesis 1.14, where the stars are created and, and rightly divided in the sky, he goes, that, that's the hermeneutical key. Uh, God himself, uh, Eberhardt teaches, uh, knows the stars by name and uh, has them numbered and he gives lots of proof texts uh, for this uh, then he goes on to quote dr uh, budgie of the british museum who went on to say that uh, astronomy is true so these are all uh, filtered into his book uh, a strong uh, appeal to uh, to the experts um, religious or or, or not uh, to discuss the sky uh, there was another constellation. Um, <clears throat> for instance, he takes the Big Dipper and notes how the handle points to the constellation, I'm not pronouncing it right, Butis, uh, with a sickle, and then connects that to the scythe of Revelation 14 that sweeps across the earth in the final harvest. Above Butis is Coma, uh, which he reads as telling the story of Virgin Mary and child of baby Jesus, Isaiah 9, 6 to 7 not as uh, Coma Berenice offering to sacrifice her long hair if Ptolemy returns safely from war, which is the long-running myth, mythic story behind that constellation. But he writes in his, uh, <clears throat> it is, in, in, his, in his lesson plan that the 12 signs of the zodiac declare in pictorial and symbolic form the complete story of God's plan and redemption. Each sign, with each sign, there are three associated constellations teaching us further details of the message of God. Thus, we find three great books in the heaven. Each book has four chapters, and each chapter has three paragraphs. Paragraphs are constellations, the chapters are signs, and the books are uh, zodiacal uh, signs. Then on this particular chart of the heavens, you can't see it here, uh, but you have the the uh, star signs of the zodiac all key to the 12 tribes of, of Israel. So Reuben is Aquarius, um, Judah is Leo, um, Benjamin is Gemini, and so on, and so on it goes. So just through that, you can, um, you can read the entire gospel, uh, as also mentioned in, in Romans, that the Lord put eternity in their hearts, and you can see by the sky uh, his creation and know his his message a uh, fun fact too christmas is around the corner we're only seven months away now eight months away uh the bethlehem star uh he says will likely be in have been was in the uh coma constellation as it has no bright stars of its own and it represents uh mary well 
as always, I didn't try to do too much, but there's a couple of more quick things I would like to mention and, and to, to wrap this wrap this up. Aberhart, like almost everyone else, went on to die. And that was on May 23rd, 1943 in Vancouver. And it was sudden, wasn't, wasn't expected. Ernest Manning, his second in command in the party and at the school uh, became premier and then a head of the Bible Institute. As Aberhart did, Manning carried on a correspondence with Albertans who often related to him as both premier, but also pastorally. And there was an interesting dynamic. You go through the correspondence of how people were relating uh, to, to their premier. Um, questions like, my daughter wants to marry a Jehovah's Witness. What should I do? Um, but the, the political answers are always good too. It's really not for me to say, so on and so forth. Uh, other letters included, uh, well, that, that's enough of, a, of an example. On one occasion in 1948, Manning responded to a listener uh, to his Back to the Bible program. Well, that's same with his wife, Muriel Eileen Preston. Um, that's her uh, uh, maiden name, and then, of course, becomes the name of uh, Preston Manning. Uh, he responded to a listener to the Back to the Bible uh, radio program. They, they met, actually, at CPBI. She was the pianist and organist there, and he was a student and then a, then a teacher. Um, all good things. Manning explained, uh, the, 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 the person wrote, wanting his interpretation of Revelation chapter 6 clarified. And I challenge you to write your premiere with that question. That, that's, your, that's your homework assignment. He responded by saying, it's describing world events of the future that will take place in the period between Christ's personal appearing at the end of the age of grace that we are in and his second coming to establish his personal millennium reign of this world, millennial reign of this world. So a bit different than Eberhardt on, on this point. He goes on to describe the four horsemen of the apocalypse that bring ancient prophecy to current events. And he refracts all his uh, biblical reading through not just a dispensational lens, but a dispensational lens that works through the Cold War and its uh, anxieties over communism and the uh, atomic uh, bomb. The rider of the red horse, he, uh, the, the whole trend in world affairs today is toward the centralization of power under one world government, where the rider of the red horse corresponds with the universal fear that prevails in this atomic age when we realize that the next main uh, world conflict will would precipitate devastation of an unprecedented scale. The riders of the black and pale horse represent global famine now that is easily brought upon by uh, chemical warfare and atomic radiation. Such mixing of theological reflection and political realities early in the Cold War will characterize Manning throughout his religious and political careers. He also had to manage the expectation of listeners. In the 1950s, Alberta began loosening and liberalizing their liquor laws, which was a shock to many back to the Bible radio listeners. You preach and you preach against alcohol. You yourself are a teetotaler and bemoan the devastation that addictions bring upon our society. And what are you doing? You're liberalizing liquor laws, um, <clears throat> uh, allowing for more licenses, for instance, uh, getting uh, away from uh, the gender segregated uh, beer halls uh, and allowing uh, alcohol and food to be served uh, simultaneously. And gone were the days, and, and, and I mean, there was a time too where you, you had to make these places unpleasant. So no chairs, uh, you had to stand. And if you wanted to eat food, you had to go to a different room. Uh, all that was, was being changed. Manning said, his response was, I appreciate uh, your, your letter uh, and the conundrum, but quote, I'm convinced that it is useless to try to legislate people into a state of temperance. He desired a dry society, but he also understood that passing laws to reform lives was no solution. His constant refrain for his evangelical listeners was that Christians should encourage spiritual revival rather than seeking the righteousness of others through legislation. For, quote, God didn't build a fence around the tree of knowledge of good and evil in the garden because he does not want forced obedience. 
And finally, leading American evangelicals took note of Manning, the conservative premier, radio broadcast minister. He developed important contacts, contacts in the Los Angeles evangelical community, including preachers like Glenn Evans from the old fashioned revival hour, Harry Royce of the revival hour, Charles E. Fuller, um, <clears throat> and, and so on. And as Manning was adept at networking, he established a strong uh, set of contacts with American evangelicals uh, and its uh, impact on American religious and economic life. He also enjoyed friendships with the likes of men like Billy Graham and uh, Philadelphia oil man J. Howard Pugh. And so there in early 1947, there was a rush of excitement in Leduc, Alberta, just south of Edmonton, as oil and fire soared into the sky. Imperial oil struck black gold, attracting oilmen north. And one such was the president of Sun Oil, J. Howard Pugh, who by the mid 1960s was heavily involved in Albertan oil production, especially early oil sands development. Manning understood that oil was Alberta's golden goose and he wanted its management to adhere to the primacy of private enterprise and real government presence to ensure that the sands do not dislocate conventional fields. Unlike the history of oil in places like Texas and California, Alberta's petrol economy was not to be handed over to the wildcatters. Manning had companies pay generous, or at least more generous than they were accustomed to, uh, royalties to the communities they drilled in, and money was to be deposited ahead of time for cleanup, all of which confounded some of these men from Southern California and East Texas. Pennsylvania, uh, who assumed that Alberta would be another Texas or California in its approach. And he was a co-religionist. So why would Sun Oil, coming from the Texan context of wildcatting, be interested in Manning's placid Alberta? Well, on the one hand, Pew liked a challenge, and the oil sands provided just that, a, a, an engineering uh, challenge to, to solve. And like Manning, he was a conservative evangelical Christian, Pugh was a huge fan of Manning's radio ministry and even described one of his sermons as the best he ever heard. The conservative Baptist premier and conservative Presbyterian oilmen found common cause in God's gift of oil and the gospel of evangelical Christianity. The two then developed a close friendship and their religious beliefs, political philosophies, and business orientations easily meshed. Eventually, construction on the Great Canadian Oil Sands Project began and it was completed in 1967. And on September the 30th, 1967, in a display that welded Canadian pride and future ambition, headed by Pew, GCOS, the Oil Sands Project was launched. And at the dedication, Premier Manning was heralded by the company executives um, in speeches quoting Genesis, where God gave humanity dominion over the earth redolent of images of a, subdue, a subdued earth in the cause of a free humanity, the dedication of the opening of the Athabasca oil sands went on. Manning was singled out as a visionary, biblically and morally astute to make possible the unlocking of the earth for human prosperity, development, and freedom. Lastly, in the end here, in the late 1960s, there was much talk of Canada's new West, a region now prosperous and confident, oil for Alberta, potash for Saskatchewan. It seemed like anything was possible. And for much of the 20th century to this point, religion and politics mixed together well enough in Alberta and in a quieter way in Saskatchewan. Were Baptists like Tommy Douglas, animated by the social gospel, preached a new Jerusalem, but spoke less of it when in office, let alone hosting a Bible program. Though I didn't cover him here, John Diefenbaker, the conservative, another Baptist, though quiet about it, uh, was a large champion for human rights from his early days as a young attorney in 1920s, in the 1920s, through, through his career. It may be said that the prairies took a secular turn in the early 70s. Alberta replaced the Bible preachers with the urbane and more sophisticated to some PC Premier Peter Lougheed and his much more secular urban party. Then. In 1974, 47 years after the, Cal the Calgary Prophetic Bible Institute was constructed and a quarter century after the Institute closed its doors, having merged with another Bible school, when the building 
that headquartered the Social Credit Party until 1966, after which it sat empty, except for a brief stint as a dance hall, demolition equipment brought the structure down, making room for commercial development in downtown Calgary as petrol wealth shepherded by Manning flowed in. What was arguably the birthplace of the social credit movement in Alberta and center of premillennial radio broadcasting in Canada ceased to exist. And two years later, a historical plaque was affixed to the new building, reminding pedestrians and shoppers alike that hymnals and Bibles once rested where now shoes and handbags gleam. Thank you. Yeah, this was it. Thank questions, you. comments? Oh, yeah, no, no, no. Comments or concerns? I, yeah, you can just take questions. I was just going to say thank you. And uh, it's quite a roller coaster of, of a history, right? From an economic, political, uh, religious standpoint. I mean, I, I don't know the history of Ontario uh, quite that well, or even British Columbia, but I'm not sure if it's quite so so wild. Um, and it would be interesting to think about the, you know, the arc to the wildfires today and Rachel mm. Notley and Danielle Smith and that battle that's shaping up. Um, but we just have about 10 minutes and um, there may be people who have questions. Um, Peter. Brian, thanks very much. I was thinking of flying Phil Gallardi, who was the Minister of Highways in British Columbia, who was a Baptist minister in Kamloops while also being Minister of Highways. Um, but that's not what I was going to ask you about. What I wanted to know was, Eberhard was of a German background, and Manning, I think, was of an English background. When Ukrainians and uh, Hungarians and other ethnicities were coming in, did, did they... Did the Manning and Eberhard people only use English, or did they have messages for newcomers to the prairies? I have not come across anything in anything other than English, like in turn, like in the archival record, and, and I haven't read about it. So my hunch is probably not. But then again, I, I don't know. I also haven't gone super local, so maybe if I went into you know car stairs, there 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 it would be. But I mean, they, the appeal was wide, right? So even though you have someone like uh, uh, William Eberhard talking about Mormons, they well, they don't really know how to read uh, the Bible. Um, the Mormons, of course, come in the late eighteen late eighteen hundreds and immediately are in social credit right from the get go. So there there is a, a whitish tint. They attract Pentecostals. It's it's very interesting, and 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 of course, you, if you think politics, people do things for different reasons. Right, so just like the CCF is a motley group of entities that probably wouldn't get along in any other context, but in this context we do. But I know I haven't come across, but that's that's an excellent question. And of course, there's many other Bibles, right? There's Catholic. There, we have the um, the Orthodox Church. Or we have the Ku Klux Klan, which I was going to talk about, but I had to cut something out, and so I cut them out. But there's also other Bibles too. You're right. Oh, sorry. Are you? How does no, this oh, work? No. I'm just standing here. Just looking I, I, I don't know what I. Um, I'm interested. I don't know about history of Mennonites on the prairies um, and in this time period and in, in these provinces, but I'm curious about evangelical Christians who might have not been necessarily aligned with some of the po political, like what the tensions were amongst evangelical Christians around social conservatism and I don't know and I'm just curious about Mennonites and I don't know if you have anything to say this is yeah. not my area so no 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 uh, I mean very very quickly uh, the Mennonites are skeptical of, of social credit uh, from the get-go uh, one of the leading Mennonite ministers in Alberta actually puts out a series of uh, articles in their in their German paper saying basic summarizing if it's too good to be true it probably is um and we are living in strained times, so so be careful how you, how you vote. But it seemed to be a, a veiled, without naming names, a real veiled perpetual prosperity. Like, let's be careful here. Caution, yeah. Uh, they would have melded nice, uh, more easily, probably with 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 Manning. 
The other thing too, going back to some of this, is that they more or less ran the governments uh, effectively and were seen as competent. So there'll be people who aren't even religious at all or even anti-religious who say, well, I mean, the, you know, the, the trains are running on time, the roads are smooth. Uh, Eberhard also uh, pours money. There's a lot of government spending coming out of the, the, the oil in, in terms of hospitals, schools, and, and highways. And that's where he tended to focus a lot of his spending. So the Mennonites had caution, uh, but the Mennonites also had caution in Saskatchewan saying, you know, we just fled the communists. What, what are we doing here? So it was, it was a mixed bag. So with due respect to the Bible and prairie history, I'm interested in the stars and the zodiac. Okay. Where did this idea come from? Oh boy. I was hoping the zodiac questions wouldn't come. I, I will admit that I'm 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 a bit of a newbie to to unpacking that. Uh, interestingly enough, in in Christian history, uh, there's a looking. Well, first of all, it is in the Bible. In in Romans one, it talks about how uh, you can look to the heavens and and there's the gospel, uh, more 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 or less. And we have examples through. Um, well, Hildegard of, of Bingen talking about um, looking to, to the stars. Uh, there's a big revival of astrology in, um, in Britain uh, in the 17, 1800s. Um, that even, even in the Church of England, um, use and, and thinking of, of, of the zodiac in, in these matters. So it may not have been a complete, a complete stretch. Uh, and... and and there was there was a lot of it about as well in in other places, related to the clan. There was also something called British Israeliism, which also was looking to the stars and to the sky, and and seeing that Britain was now in fact manifestation of of uh, the chosen people. Uh, and then there's numerology in there to locate that the Millennial Kingdom will be in Alberta. And then when Eberhardt became premier and his name was so similar to the word Alberta, it feels like the new Jerusalem will be descending uh, at any time now. And Eberhardt gets letters from people saying, I had a dream of you last night where you were ensconced in a blue light with three stars as you descended uh, to on, onto Edmonton. And there's no responding letter, uh, but so I don't want to comment on, on, on his response, but I think there was a lot of it about. And while that'll be jettisoned quickly by, by Manning, um, by the end of his life too, uh, some historians have detected an increased interest in what might be called uh, occultic knowledge or palmistry uh, in, in Eberhardt's eclecticism. So, so it's not surprising and he proof texts it a lot. There's, there's a lot of star imagery in the Bible. So why not look there? That's the best I can do at the moment. Time for maybe one more. You got one from online? Yeah, I've got time for one. We have an online question from Daniel. He asks, what do you think finding copies of the play that you mentioned at the beginning of your talk signifies? Uh, I think it signifies the, some of the stuff that, uh, some of the language around the vaccines even um, a couple of years ago, uh, it was, the branding of people like cattle, a government um, imposition on 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 um, on uh, people, and that this is not the Albertan way. Um, I mean, the article was it was a slim one, but when I chanced upon it, I go, oh, "This this is it. This is how I start everything from now on." Uh, but this person is circulating it was trying to just draw attention that these government regulations. Uh, have a trajectory to this sort of coming oppression. And there were there were talks in some certain, I'm not speaking specifically Alberta stuff, but should we think of like the, the cards? Like there was a lot of apocalyptic language being used just in the last couple of years over mandates regarding vaccines and so forth. I'm not commenting on that stuff at all, just that moments of crisis perhaps make it fertile ground. And I think someone saw it and, and it's it's short. You can You can read this thing in 10 minutes. Maybe just finally, before we let you go, can you um, give us a little 
but is this part of your book project? Is this, what is the kind of arc of what you're trying to do with this oh, piece of research? I'm part of a, it's, the book was originally called Northern Aaron and it was American evangelicals coming to Canada and it grew and expanded. And now it's called A Prairie Gospel, The Rise and Demise of a Bible Culture. But there's an epilogue, right? Because uh, then we have Scott Moe, quiet Mennonite premier of, of Saskatchewan. And then we have Preston Manning, who pulls some of this stuff up. And his mantra was always the, the Bible verse, wise as serpents, innocent as doves. Um, and in his first book in 92, A New Canada, unpacks his relationship of his evangelical Christianity and, and uh, politics. Stephen Harper, of course, was an Alliance uh, member. So there is a bit of a quiet um, turn of the century uh, return uh, to the Bible, but in a quieter, more muted way. Well, thank you. Thank you for sharing with that, this with us. It's been really, really interesting. And it's been great having you here. So maybe you could join me and thank Brian for his talk today.